Actors are not prostitutes. They are prophets who prophesy through story, movement, and emotion. Hi, and welcome to the Story of Podcast, where storytellers disrupt. I'm David Neronia. And I'm Fabiano Altamura. Before we dive in today, remember to like, follow, download, and give us that five-star review. Five-star review. Come on. Five-star review. So I wanted to talk today about how our fathers mm. impacted us in our choice to become artists, mm. right? Because... I know both of our stories very, very well. Obviously, I know mine very, very well. Yeah. Um, but my dad was a very, very disruptive storyteller in how he went against his family tradition. Ah. Right? Because obviously we're talking about just disruptive storytellers isn't just in the art we make. It's the lifestyle we choose to live, right? And I, to this day, I'm very, very inspired by the choices my father made and how it impacted the course of my life and my, and my family's life generationally. You know, my dad was, was, was from a family of 10. Wow. And none of them lived all in the same house. Cause if you ever come to Italy with me, which you've said you would for a long time, but you haven't yet would come to see my grandma's house. It was literally three rooms in a galley style. You walked into the living room, you then walk into the bedroom, then to the kitchen. And it was tiny. And so half of the family would live with his grandparents and half would live with his mom. Well, yeah, because I mean, nine kids alone in a house. And then, I mean, once you start having kids, it's like, how can you even gather? I mean, my gosh, what are we talking? I mean, how many c cousins and- Oh, I mean, I have second... probably 30 first cousins alone, <laughs> right? Alone. You're so I Italian. And I have family that I don't even know that I have the last name with. Wow. It's crazy. But one of the things my dad did was, this is my question, because, you know, we talk about nurture and nature. Mm. My dad wasn't nurtured into being an entrepreneur mm. because he had no idea how to do it. You know, I remember once he was telling me at school, he was, he was in a class and the teacher asked him, what do you want to be? And bearing in mind, this is in the fifties mm. in the South of Italy, in a town of 3000 people, wow. if that. And he said he wanted to be an actor and they laughed him out of the room. And it's so funny, you know, when you're called to do art or you get this artistic calling, if you don't fulfill it in one way, it's going to emerge in some other way, in some other shape, mm -hmm. in some other form. But like water finds an exit or an entrance, so does art. The only thing that comes to mind, because I know so little about Italy other than films, is cinema Paradiso, Paradiso or Paradiso. Cinema Paradiso, yeah. Um, and the the boy, <laughs> the little boy is such so adorable in that film. If you've not seen that film, you've got to see it. Now, I think that's probably further back than your dad's days, but it's probably not a bad mm -hmm. equivalent, right? I mean, it, it, Cinema Paradiso or Cinema Paradiso uh, takes place in a small little Italian mm -hmm. town. I could imagine your father kind of running around in little boots and knickers or something, right? Well, when he when he didn't have when well, he had money for shoes, if he had shoes, yeah. Okay, so your father's creativity ends up expressing itself um, because your your father is such a, a obviously a very good businessman mm -hmm. was very shrewd in the best of ways. Mm -hmm. Like he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and became very very successful. But talk to us a little bit about how your father's creativity, that thing that expressed itself as I want to be an actor. Mm -hmm. What form does it ultimately take for your father creatively? So at sixteen. He had a very, very successful barber shop mm -hmm. in his village. And he literally was working from 7 a.m. to like midnight. But every day. But we got to clarify, I would imagine, and maybe I'm just romanticizing or making this up, but knowing you, I don't think this has got to be a far cry from the truth. When you say barber shop, that means something else in the United States. Yes. So, no, I'm talking about flamboyant styles. I'm talking like. You know, we look at certain barber shops, like barbers, barbers now are kind of like rock stars. You know, they, they, it's, be, it's an, a trade that has been exploding for the last 12, 15 years, right? And it's now, almost like a renaissance. It's just... a complete renaissance, complete renaissance. Renaissance. Can eat renaissance. And um, 
<laughs> it's emerging, but he actually started this trend and took it to the UK. And I believe that his his influence in the city, because he moved from a town of 3,000 to a town of like, say, six to 700,000 people, which wow. is huge wow. compared to where he's come from. But he went to the UK with two tailored suits. Mm. So he went and influenced the style fashion-wise and also in barbering. And he had probably one of the most successful shops in the city. How did he, did he study? He didn't. He learned from his cousin. You've got to be kidding me. Just by watching. I did not know this part of the story. Mm -hmm. Just by watching. How old was he when he began to learn? Like 14. He had his own shop at 16. So see, this is quintessential like apprenticeship, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. 100. Shoulder to shoulder, mm -hmm. observing, serving, probably sweeping hair. Oh, every dude, sweeping hair, cleaning the shop. Everything. You know, we think with art nowadays that it's all about the creation rather than by understanding the mechanics of it. So when I like fast, I mean, we'll go back, but just my dad made me learn hairdressing at the age of 10. I would go into his hairdressing shop and I'd want to cut straight away. He says, no, you clean the shop, maintain your station and just sweep up before I could even learn to wash hair. Your dad, I have never had this thought, but he was the Italian Mr. Miyagi. He was the Italian mystic. Because I can imagine I mean, that what you were, because I, I, you know, knowing Fab, it's all about, not all about, but but style. And we've, we've talked about this and even joked about it a little bit, but you see the world through a lens of style mm -hmm. and design. I would imagine that in your father's barbershop, you were learning not just hard work and discipline, mm -hmm. but understanding how to serve an art form. Mm-hmm and how to learn it as an apprenticeship, almost as a woodworker. Mm -hmm. It's a really ancient father-son story. It's an ancient father-son story. And I see it, if you guys haven't watched it, there's a cigar lounge in the UK called Davidoff of London. Mm -hmm. And Edward and Eddie Sahakian, father and son, loving this beautiful craft of being cigar connoisseurs and seeing how they interact with each other on YouTube is so honorable. And I'm not saying I always had that with my father. I used to berate him for going to the barbershop. Um, but actually looking back in hindsight, I don't know who taught my dad to be an artist or to who taught him detail and style, design, fashion. But dude, the guy was a boss and he taught me, and I'm the only one. Mm. So he didn't have the time with his parents. His dad used to work in Belgium mm. to get money for the family. And he taught me so many interesting lessons, just learning from life. He said, listen, if you don't have to make the mistakes of some, why do you have to make the mistakes somebody else has made? Why not learn from somebody else's mistakes? Which you think is simple, but a lot of people are like, I want to make the mistakes myself. It's like, you will get so much more acceleration in life if you learn from the mistakes of others rather than having to make them yourself. This is... Um this is something that we're walking through as a family right now, just, you know, raising uh, three teenage boys and also having a daughter. And the funny thing is, is that I think parenting reveals to you that sometimes you end up parenting yourself, mm -hmm. you know, in that your children, they're their own people, but there's also shades of you, aspects of you in mm -hmm. them. And you end up looking at your children sometimes going, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I was exactly the same way. You know, Will Smith in his book, in his biography, he talks about building this brick wall mm. with his dad, like the, the you know, around, um, his father had, uh, I think both an automotive service and also ice making. Anyways, the father was an entrepreneur in the inner city and, uh, there was something up with the wall. And so, you know, he didn't have money to pay anybody else to do it. So he taught his sons how to mix cement. I think it was in Philly mm. and I think it takes him a year. And they were little. I mean, we're talking boys. Mm -hmm. You know, by standards today, we would think, oh my gosh, how can you ask a, a seven or an eight or a nine-year-old boy? But this goes back a long, long way between fathers and sons. Mm -hmm. I think what fathers sometimes do best is to ask of their children what maybe a mother can't and isn't necessarily her role to. And it's not that women can't raise kids and that we we, don't, we need each other. We absolutely mm -hmm. need, all, you know, both genders to raise children, I think, at our best. But there's something about that male challenge that says to you, no, you're going to do this. You're going to sweat today. You're going to work right. today. You're going to do something that you don't actually want, want to, to do. I'm going to move you into discomfort to prepare you for the life that you're going to mm -hmm. live. Um, that's important, right? 
because we don't know anything. We have to, we may not like it at the time. It may feel uncomfortable, but I tell you what, what my dad instilled in me from going to a barber shop at 10 years old taught me how to have value mm. for the craft, taught me how to have value for art, knowing that it's, you have to work for it. It doesn't just land in your lap. Just because the Lord gives you a calling doesn't mean it's just going to happen by osmosis. That principle right there of, you know, you see this in Atomic Habits, right? We, mm -hmm. we both talked about the story where the cycling team was was losing and so on and so forth. And I think it's clear, uh, the author, uh, you know, talks about how uh, the, the coach of this cycling team analyzed, I think it was like a hundred different components or something of this particular, you know, of cycling itself, mm -hmm. everything from the dust on the wheels to the temperatures of the, uh, of the quads to the oil on the chain. I mean, mm -hmm. just broke down every single element and said, you know, if we can just increase performance of each of these individual elements, these 100 elements by 1%, what does that add up to? 100%. That's right. Improvement just through incremental small. Yes. And, uh, and often, and I think in our culture, specifically now with things so accessible to us and d everything is double click. We've lost an appreciation for that fathering incremental quality mm -hmm. of being at your father's side, shoulder to shoulder, learning a trade, mm -hmm. learning a craft. Mm -hmm. Maybe you weren't even, who knows? You'll never know whether or not you actually had a natural talent, but you did mm -hmm. clock 10,000 plus hours at it. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah. I can tell you from experience, because Fab has cut my hair. He's, yeah, he's, he's it's the fermentation guy. process, isn't it? Describe for me this, uh, just because I think this is a beautiful part of the story. Mm. Describe for me the shop. And what it looked oh, like. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, that is so cool. <laughs> I remember my first dad, sh it had red tiles on the floor. Of course floor. it did. Red tiles on the floor, super old school. You could smoke in the shop. So everybody was smoking. And there were like those tabletop arcade games. Ooh. So what? people could, yeah. Oh, I did not People know could play the tabletop arcade games. And then he renovated it. And then he had some beautiful... There were white porcelain tiles, but very Italian, mm. very elegant. He had some nice um, new leather benches put in. And then he would have like a marbling effect done to all of his Doors. cabinets. Oh, and and it was it was it was cool. It wouldn't be the way I it wasn't the way I did my barbershop, but it kind of it aged really well. And the shop was called Michelangelo's. Of course it was. How how and and Th though you are an actor by trade, have gone mm -hmm. off, worked professionally, so on and so forth, you're also a businessman and you mm -hmm. ran a shop, your own shop mm -hmm. in the UK, right? I did. Describe for me that shop. Oh, dude, that was super old school. I mean, we had wood flooring, marble on the walls, old Chesterfields, 120 year old barber chairs where you could go back and have, you know, hot towel, wet shaves. Like a Sweeney Todd type shape. It was beautiful, dude. Oh yeah, yeah, but not like that. <laughs> um, we had French Louis Leaf mirrors and exposed brick, exposed, uh, I had a fresco painted on the ceiling and it was it was beautiful. It still there to this day, I sold it to, to my friend when I I've never here. seen pictures. Oh, you haven't? We've got to post pictures when we post this. We should so do, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I can get some good ones from, yeah, back in the day. Brilliant. That'd be brilliant. I know. What about your dad, dude? So like, you know, we, we talk about the, the, the legacy of from fathers to, for the, to the children. What, what about you? What did, how, would, how did your growing up affect you and your choice to become an actor? Mine is going to be different, but I'm fascinated at exploring the question. Mm -hmm. To be quite honest with you, when I think about you and your father, when I think about the barbershop, when I think about design and style in your family, you and your father share that so well. Um, it's a beautiful story. I think it lends itself. Uh, I can see the direct connect between you and your father and creativity. Mm. I think for me, the way that I would have to approach this question is, I think it shaped me in a couple ways that were unintended. Mm. I actually think that because my parents were young, and it's a story that I've shared, so you can check out an earlier episode where I share a little bit about my childhood. But in summary, if you haven't, I had teenage parents. And so my dad was 15, my mom was 17. And, um, you know, it was a bit of a shotgun Cuban uh, wedding because, <laughs> you know, uh, they got married in October. I was born in December. You can do the math. I think what I, I think it shaped me in the following ways. I, I don't blame my parents for this at all, but I mean, they were busy. They, they had to work to, to make a living and we had support from family. I think it may have left me seeking attention. I was very well loved by my grandmother and my mom and my dad. They were lovely people doing the best that they could. But I wonder sometimes if it left me wanting 
attention in a certain way. This, this is a story that I don't I don't know if I've shared with you, but I remember I got asked to sing the uh, Star Spangled Banner for graduation. Mm. And I remember that when I mentioned it to my mom, and she was busy. I mean, at that point, my parents were divorced, and so she was working long hours and traveling a far, far away to work and raising my sister and I. My dad was was involved in our life, but you know, she was the one taking care of us mm-hmm. six days a week. And um, I mentioned it to her, and I didn't get much of a reaction. And I can still recall feeling like a little bit let down that, and I don't think my mom intended this. What I found out later was how proud my mm-hmm. my mom was. At graduation. Carnegie or high school? So this was in high school. Yeah. So this was back in high school. Um, and there were a, a few moments like that that I think marked me in that way. But I think to your to your question, and by the way, actually, to finish that thought, I think in the seeking for significance, which so many artists, I think, begin their journeys mm-hmm. in that way. Mm-hmm. There was a kind of unraveling that I had to go through in order to really discover what acting was really about. Because I think when it's about significance or attention or spotlight on you, I think that can lead you down some pretty unhealthy roads if it's just that. Mm -hmm. But I think the impact that my father had on me, and I've grown to appreciate this so much more the older that I get, is that my dad is a really sensitive soul. And I've gotten to see that in his older age. My dad became a respiratory therapist later in life. He finally got his, you know, he had to quit high school to Mm -hmm. go get a construction job with my very upset Cuban grandfather, father to my mother. You can imagine. There's a story where my grandfather actually put my dad up lifting buckets of concrete all day long, four stories up on scaffolding with no safety gear. Oh my goodness. My father was convinced that really what my grandfather wanted was (laughs) him to die. To to off him so that he wouldn't survive. He was so pissed at getting his daughter pregnant. I can kind of relate having a seven-year-old girl. I can only imagine what my grandfather was going through. But my dad becomes a respiratory therapist. He graduates from high school. He, he kind of reboots his entire life. He had been a drug addict and an alcoholic for a good mm-hmm. portion of my childhood. My dad is now vegan and completely clean, mm-hmm. doesn't even uh, drink alcohol. But my dad becomes a respiratory therapist and he gets voted like employee of the month. I don't know, like four or five times. Mm. My dad would send me pictures of, because as a respiratory therapist, and especially so during COVID, he was at bedside with people who were on the verge of death Mm -hmm. for sometimes months doing end of life care or near end of life care. And the reason why my dad ultimately had to quit was because he was so affected. Mm. He fell in love with these people. He would send me pictures of people that he was, he was caring for long-term. And my dad saw dozens and dozens and dozens of people pass away. Oh my goodness. And my mom has a huge heart. She's a very passionate woman, but I would say that my dad has a kind of sensitivity that got revealed through respiratory therapy and through him helping other people that actually revealed something about me. In hearing my dad talk about stories and the way that I think I would be heavily affected emotionally by certain things or, Mm -hmm. you know, as actors or as singers or whatever, when you look at a piece of material and you're moved by Mm -hmm. it, I think to myself, the reason why I think I'm sensitive to material is because of my dad. Mm -hmm. I think there's that part, though he, I wouldn't necessarily describe my dad as an artist or as a a traditional creative. Mm -hmm. He has gotten into woodwork. Well, he likes the woodwork. Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think it's his sensitivity. Yeah. You and what makes me funny about you and your dad is you both, um, you both play music all the time. All the time. All the time. It's like your dad will be. We'll be. We were at Sun Hero Camp together that years ago, and um, your dad would be there with his iPhone playing Spotify, and it's the same with you. Before I leave the driveway, <laughs> I infuriate my family because um, my wife. I have. I gave her a Bluetooth. I don't think she's ever used it. My wife will <laughs> play music by putting the phone like on the, which to me is like regressing back to like an eight track in the car. Like it's rough. But I'm like, babe, you've got a whole sound system. For me, music has to reflect the mood that I'm in. So mm. I have everything from classical music to country music to Ooh. pop to. <laughs> <laughs> you name it, even soul and R and B. Oh yeah, you do. There you are. So listen. So it was. It was. Who was the person? Because obviously, your parents were young, 
-hmm. So maybe they didn't have that impact that somebody else may have had on your choice to become an artist. So who was it? For me, that question is super easy. Uh, I think the person that triggered my creative journey was uh, Dr. Riley. She was an English teacher in high school. And um, that woman called out the creative in me, maybe out of desperation and necessity as the, you know educational directors yeah, no, yeah. sometimes mm -hmm. want yeah, to right. be, because I'm not quite sure that I was like the most apparent choice. Um, but she was my English teacher. She was my AP English teacher. She, we call her Dr. Riley because she actually had a PhD and um, she cast me in Sound of Music, which I shared that that story in an earlier episode. Mm. And and she was the one that really started me on, on my journey, but it, it goes beyond that. I had a whole, it's a little bit different than the topic that we're going after today, but maybe we're talking about mothers and fathers mm -hmm. that influence our, our journey maybe. Mm -hmm. I had Dr. Riley, I had Peggy Hall, I had mm. Jenny Krugman, I had uh, Victoria Santa Cruz in, I probably had about four or five women. Women, yeah. Who changed, they, they didn't even just set me on my creative journey. They, they changed the course of my life. My mom, my grandmother, I mean, my mom who chose to have me as a teenage mother. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's interesting for me is though women have mentored me and guided me and that was a beautiful thing and mm -hmm. I'm grateful for it. It also meant that I had to kind of find my way towards the masculine and what it looks like. And I actually found that in the company of good men at church mm -hmm. in men's groups. That's awesome. It was pastors and stuff who began to father in me. And now my dad and I have, we have a, a deep relationship. Mm -hmm. We have, we, we hit sometimes we'll get talking and we'll go for hours and hours. Well, you're nearly the same age. We are, we're 15 years apart. You know what I mean? Apart. It's like 15 years apart. So at our age, it's kind of nothing, is it? He made a joke about AARP, you know, that's the, the you know, the the organization for uh, people over 50. Oh, okay. And, which uh, you're in now. Which I'm officially in. I got that wow. card the other day in the mail and, you know, it's- You did? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. No, you did. I did. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> you get benefits, man. Like you can get the blue plate special at, at you know, at Denny's. No, that's what my oh, dad and I joke about. Oh, gosh, I was going to say. But you get all oh. kinds of discounts. Oh, you do? I've never, yeah, ever heard of it. You just have to go to the movies at like 9 a.m. Nice. Yeah, well, we're all working. Before bed. I mean, you know, I think what I'd love for our audience to take away is there's not everybody mm -hmm. that has a parent because, you know, we talk about fathers and mothers. Some people may get easily triggered by that mm -hmm. because like yours wasn't a traditional, it wasn't okay. a traditional family growing up. Mine, I would say relatively was, even though, you know, there's a level, a, a certain level of dysfunction there um, because parents are parent from what they know, right? But there's always that one person, I believe, teacher, brother, pastor, whoever it is, somebody that is catalytic in our life that ultimately will inspire us to go after the dreams that God has put in us, mm -hmm. whether we know God has given us because you, you didn't know the Lord up until later in life. I knew the Lord. I think really had an encounter with him when I was 10, didn't get saved until I was like 15, 16. But you know, I think my, my dad, what I respect about him so much is he wasn't taught this. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he learned it, but he did. And a lot of the times, that's why I say nurture or nurture to start with. I think for him, it was just a nature thing. I think God places things in our design and in our making. Yeah. He's interwoven in us, right? Yeah. And sometimes it's lying dormant. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it just takes the scent of something, the image of something, some, somebody calling out a word. I mean, how many times with students, and we've shared a little bit about this, but I believe most of our role at Bethel Conservatory of the Arts, where we have programs in acting, filmmaking, music theater, dance, uh, screenwriting. I say, you know, I often tell our students, you think you came here to act. Mm -hmm. You think you came here to write. And of course, in some way, shape or form, in an earthly way, we did. Yeah. yeah. Vocationally, we did. Mm -hmm. But time and time again, what happens at our school is that because we father and mother and pastor our students and we walk this out with them in the presence of the lord we see this escalation this mm -hmm. exponential growth and transformation that can only happen mm -hmm. when someone is truly fathered and mothered and of course it it, it begins with him yeah and it th there's a complete i mean it's weird because there's a disruption to their life 
They think they're coming for one thing. They get that and something else, you know, but I wonder if, if people didn't have the opportunity to be under people that inspired them, how many Michelangelo's, Leonardo's artists out there are there? that have never even realized any of their creativity. I think most I think most of the time I think about this. I fell in love with writing because I had a teacher who loved writing. Yeah. I fell in love with acting because I had a teacher who loved drama. Mm -hmm. From the Greek to Shakespeare to poetry. You know, we we and it was her passion, mm -hmm. her deep understanding. I mean, I think you mentioned that you went through this kind of revelatory process with Shakespeare where yeah. you thought, "Oh, well, well, the thing is, it was like, you know, I, I, it's so funny how much I've learned actually about myself as an actor being in Reading rather than pre being in Reading. Well, and teaching I, something, right? And teaching something. But it was like, you know, I remember Diane Venora, who you had a huge encounter with. You know, you can share, I think you've shared that about the prostitutes. You know, she said, you know, the prostitute so, actors are. Yeah, D Diane Venora, for those of you that may not heard this story, Diane Venora, just a legendary actress, Juilliard trained, Pacino, you name it. I mean, high, high level, you know, Shakespeare, you name it. She comes to the School of Ministry. Um, we're in this kind of creativity track. Uh, everybody says, you know, we often joke. It's like if two people are from Miami, you got to know Joe from Miami because mm -hmm. everybody from Miami apparently right, needs right. to know each other. Well, there's two actors or three actors, four actors walk at that time. It was like maybe three yeah. walking around a school of ministry. And everybody says, you got to meet Diane Venora. I said, I can't wait to meet this Diane Venora. And sure enough, she comes to talk in this mm -hmm. kind of elective creativity track. She walks over to me. She introduces herself. I say, hi. I, f I finally, it, it like clicks. Oh, this is Diane Venora. And all of a sudden I'm getting these flashbacks from all these major films that I've seen this woman. Yes. In, right? And um, she puts her uh, hand on my sternum and she says, I can't wait to see what the Lord does. Now I know that it was the anointing back to this earlier point right. that I'm making. It's Diane's anointing as actress, mm -hmm. as prophet. Mm -hmm. When she lays her hand on my sternum, it's like something broke open and unlocked. And it was early days in my kind of charismatic hearing God walk with the Lord. I mean, I was saved, but I, I, I wasn't like born again. Mm -hmm. And I hear the Lord say, I, by the way, I buckle over and I start crying mm -hmm. in the middle yeah. of class. And then I hear the Lord say, specifically in this moment, I've, I've rephrased it to open it up to other artists, but I hear the Lord say, actors are not prostitutes. Mm -hmm. They are prophets who prophesy through story, movement, and emotion. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it takes mentors, fathers, and mothers to unlock mm -hmm. what God's placed mm -hmm. in our design. Yeah. I mean, I, I said to her, you know, the thing is about 2013, we were at Philip Atmore's wedding. And Philip Atmore, for those that don't know, he's a Broadway star, just Fred Astaire Award, probably three years on the trot, just amazing, uh, Philip and Joy. And Diane was there and we were there in Pasadena. And I went, you know, I don't know if I like Shakespeare anymore. I think it's a bit irrelevant. And she looks at me and she just, as Diane Venora <laughs> does, who is amazing, says, you have no idea what you're talking about. What you've done is you have brought Romeo down to your level when you need to elevate yourself to Romeo's level. <laughs> Why? Because you're not tried and tested. He stood the test of time. He's epic. You're not. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I was just completely getting, oh, uh, but do you know what? That was the biggest revelation for me. Again, from another mentor, like she's been a spiritual and um, acting mentor to my daughter. She's a mother. She's a mother, complete mother. In the craft, in right. the faith. And if you want to check her out, Transformation Artists L.A., you have to, if you need any acting classes, go and see Diane Venora. But she changed my life. Like my dad changed my life in the way of, you know, moving away from his family, moving away from Italy to the UK, transforming everything, becoming a, an amazing artist, then imparting that to me and then having other people in my life that have inspired me to continue on and still inspire me. Because without those kinds of people, how do we grow? We don't. And I've been thinking about this a lot, and I've been thinking about how it stunted my growth mm -hmm. in so many ways. You know, we had an actor on in an earlier episode, and he talked about continuing to train. And mm -hmm. I'm almost embarrassed 
to acknowledge this and to confess this, but I didn't continue training. It's because it worked a lot though as well, dude. I did. I did. But can I, can I be, can I confess something yeah. to you? I, I worked, but I had plenty of time to continue to study. Mm-hmm. It did stunt my growth. And the reason I didn't was because of pride. Mm, because I had gone to this great school and I never had to take class again and so on and so forth, which is like saying like a runner doesn't need to continue to train or right. a bodybuilder doesn't need to get back to the gym. Like I, I think it actually really stunted my, my growth. So that speaks to training, which often mentors and fathers and mothers challenge you and charge you to continue. And even coaches, which is a form of mentorship. Mm-hmm. But I feel like we're supposed to talk and lean into this, this point even a little bit further because of my own father and mother things, issues, again, wounds, wounds. I stayed away from people, from mentors and fathers and mothers that could have escalated and, and, and supercharged my path. Mm-hmm. This is whether creatively, financially, yeah. spiritually, mm-hmm. I feel like so many of our students show up and yes, we're teaching them a craft, but so often, I mean, I've had students sit with me and say, I have to admit to you after they kind of got upset at me and I thought, gosh, I don't really know what's going on here. I, I think I've treated this student fairly. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes I had to make an adjustment, but quite often they would tell me in a one-on-one later, it's just, I have issues with my dad mm-hmm. and I would go, oh, and so I just want to encourage anybody that's out there. If you have struggles if you have, like Fab said, woundings in that father-mother place, please go seek counseling mm-hmm. and help pastorally, mentorship and coaching. I, I just, I don't think there's an aspect of our life that wouldn't improve if we didn't get, if I mm-hmm. hadn't gotten more humble more quickly in those those areas. Yeah. And we, we're, we're, we're privileged to have so many amazing people Oof. in our environment, right? That can... You know, I interviewed Bill Johnson today and having access to people like that, that you get to speak into you and you're like, it's, it's incredible, right? It's like spiritual FIFA. Oh, <laughs> FIFA. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? <laughs> spiritual FIFA. <laughs> it's like world, everywhere you turn, it's like, yeah. there's Arsenal, there's United. Right. It's, it's like, yeah, it's being in the Premier League of, of who's the who. head coach of yeah, Barcelona. Yeah, yeah. And I, I feel that, you know, sometimes we don't want the mentors because what, a mental role has been represented or modeled to by parents, which could be painful. Mm. You know what I mean? But I think, um, but also maybe because it's scary because you might have to change. Well, you might have to change. And some people say they want to change, but then don't want to change because it's more painful to change, you know, but I think that as artists, if we're not growing, we're going to die. I think if you're human and you're not Not growing, growing, you're going to die. Yeah. I don't know that there's any neutral, I don't know. There's any any neutral ground. If you ain't going forward, you are going backwards. There it is, man. I mean, I think we started with fathers and mothers. You know, Joseph Campbell, maybe we'll kind of start to to land the plane on this. Uh, Joseph Campbell talks about archetypes. Mm. and um, Archetypes or archetypes? <laughs> you say tomato. Um, and, but there's some thinking around it that used to, we used to believe that um, ar- archetypes or archetypes. Uh, which are basically, it's like a fancy Greek word for the types of characters that you often see mm-hmm. stories. You see this in Commedia dell'arte yeah. where, you know, you have uh, the Joker or the Jester mm-hmm. and you have the mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi, yeah, let's yeah. say, and and the hero. And there's there's lots of, there's the villain and the shadow and all these different kinds of archetypes. But I think the most beautiful thing that I've learned through teaching story, but I think it's so applicable to life, is that there's there's theory about story and about archetypes that says that they're not fixed. Mm. That you can t- that they're more like Greek ma- masks. So that the mentor mask can actually be worn by any character mm-hmm. for a moment. Mm-hmm. And as I as we kind of recap our life, as we kind of look back, mm-hmm. and as maybe others ponder their life, I want to encourage people to look back. Because I, I would suspect that God has placed the mentor archetype mask on fathers, mothers, mm-hmm. teachers, even friends and, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. And we can wear those masks momentarily. Mm-hmm. And those moments, I think if we pay attention to it, I think can change the course of your yeah. life. It's good, man. Yeah, it's good. 
Well, guys, it's been great hanging out with you here at Storia. Please remember to like, download, follow, and give us that five-star review. We'll see you soon. Plus. Thank <laughs> you.